What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, I speak with Dr. Heather Berlin, a cognitive neuroscientist and assistant professor of psychiatry at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and a practitioner of clinical neuropsychology at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She is host of the PBS series, Science Goes to the Movies, and the Discovery Channel series, Superhuman Showdown, and co-wrote and stars in the critically acclaimed Off-Broadway and Edinburgh Fringe Festival show, Off the Top, about the neuroscience of improvisation. Berlin has made numerous media appearances, including on the BBC, History Channel, Netflix, Nat Geo, Star Talk, and TEDx. She received her PhD from the University of Oxford and a Master's of Public Health from Harvard University. In this episode, we explore the neural basis of consciousness, a materialist perspective on reality that accounts for the nature of experience by putting the brain front and center in the unfolding drama of human perception. Where do our thoughts and our feelings come from? Who is in charge of our volitions and our desires? What is the physiological basis of depression, anxiety, and psychosis? What is the substantive source of human creativity, inspiration, and genius? And is there really nothing more to the experience of consciousness, to life itself, than the observable firing of billions of neurons jumbled together in an atomic stew consisting almost entirely of empty space? As always, you can gain access to reading lists put together by me ahead of every episode by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. Lastly, if you are listening to the show on iTunes or Android, make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how the show is made or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now, let's get right to this week's conversation. So, Dr. Heather Berlin, it's really wonderful having you in studio. Yeah, happy to be here. Is this your first time in a hip-hop studio? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive, but the first thing I noticed was this amazing smell of uh, weed. <laughs> yeah. And I walked in, it's like 11 in the morning, I'm like, uh, am I going to get high from being in here? If you were here at 8 a.m., it would have it would be like a hot box in here. What, leftover from the night before? Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think people leave, what time do people leave still from here? Like 3 or 4, 4 a.m.? Yeah, so imagine what it must be like at like 4 a.m. Wow. Yeah, I prefer not to do them at 8 a.m. because I don't know if we're going to be able to like keep it together. Well, I'm definitely getting like a contact high for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you're, um, before we started, you said yeah. your husband is a hip-hop My artist? My husband's a rapper. That's amazing. Yeah, so he's serious. I mean, that's how he makes his living. Um he, uh, he, but he raps about, about academic topics. So he raps about science and literature and, uh, really, yeah, he's had several off Broadway shows. Um, what's his name? His name is Baba Brinkman and, uh, um, Baba Brinkman. Yeah. And actually you'd be interested in his latest. So he writes these rap guides. He's done the rap guide to evolution, um, to human nature. And now his latest is a rap guide to consciousness. So actually as we speak now, he's recording, a Facebook Live with a friend of mine, with Deepak Chopra, to promote his new album, The Rap Guide to Consciousness. That's so interesting. Yeah. How long have you, when did you first meet your husband? Uh, we met in 2012, and I was actually giving a, a talk, like a kind of like a TED Talk, but in New York, it was something called Lucid NYC, like at like a cool place in East Village where they had these academic talks. And I gave a talk, and then he came on stage after me and did a performance from his latest show. So we kind of like saw each other That's on so stage, cool. and then he kind of picked me up after the show. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, and now we have two kids. and uh, yeah, yeah, you just had another child recently, yeah, right? Congratulations. Have, thank you. I have a uh, like three and a half year, actually three and three quarters, she would say, a girl and a uh, <laughs> 11 month old boy. So you're going to stop? Is that it? I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. We'll see. I mean, you never know. You but never know. Yeah, I'm That's good. the nature of uh, the human biological experience. Right. And we're going to talk about the biology of the brain as well. So, But you said you that's interesting. So you're meeting Deepak Chopra. Tell me a little bit about him because you guys have a, you guys differ in your sort of conceptions of reality and consciousness. And Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm meeting him for lunch actually right after this. But uh, we, you know, it all started because I was at this consciousness meeting um, in Tucson and... Uh, 
he was there talking and I just tweeted something like, oh, I'm hearing Deepak right now. Don't believe the hype or <laughs> when something. Was this? <laughs> that was a few years ago. I love that. When was... that was a few years ago, maybe oh, in 2014 or so. And, uh, and all, and he got back to me. He got back to me, and he said, and he like responded to me and said, "Hey, you know, basically, would you like to meet and talk about this?" So uh, we did. <laughs> I did a couple of interviews with him, and you know, we disagree, but I like, I respect the fact that he wants to engage with people who disagree mm. with him and have these like intellectual debates, and um, you know, so I believe, I from a scientific perspective, that consciousness is created by the brain um, or product of the brain and um, or an emergent property, however you want to say it. And his idea is that consciousness just exists in the universe. It's immaterial. And matter is a manifestation of consciousness. So matter wouldn't exist without consciousness. So it's kind of like flipping everything on its head. And, right. you know, there's no evidence for that. I mean, it sounds kind of cool and, you know. Especially so, with this weed smell right now, but I mean, <laughs> I, you have a very strong sense of smell. Um, yeah. I don't smell anything right now, and I have a pretty good sense of smell. Well, also, women, um, when you're pregnant, it increases. Why is that? Your, Are you yeah, pregnant? I'm not pregnant. Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> that, actually, that's what we were not. See, maybe it's three. So, so what you're touching on is a sort of distinction between materialism and uh, an immaterial sense of uh, of the origin of consciousness or the seat of consciousness. Right. Um, you're saying that Deepak, his sort of conception of this is that consciousness is a prerequisite for matter. That's what he's saying. So I'm kind of, I don't have a clear theory on the immaterial sort of view of consciousness that, you know, mm -hmm. Deepak, I suppose, professes. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not clear on what he thinks, mm -hmm. but I do find the materialist theory unconvincing. And mm -hmm. I'd love for you to try to convince me on it here. So this is okay. where I struggle with it. And you said there's no evidence for his theory true. Mm -hmm. But in my view, the empirical method doesn't work in answering the questions of the nature of reality and consciousness because of the fact, and I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with this, but because of the fact that I could be tripping right now mm -hmm. and have absolutely and I am tripping in a way mm -hmm. I mean certainly yeah. this is a simulation of my mind mm -hmm. what do you what do you say to that sort of perspective that absolutely basically your perception is a controlled hallucination it is it's all hallucination so it's a creation of your mind so the brain itself inside this box never actually directly experiences anything mm. right mm -hmm. it's a simulation based on signals that are coming in you know from your retina and information coming from ears and they're just electrical impulses that are translated to other information or signals in the brain and the brain then interprets that and then all and then there's something you know people think something magic happens and then we have perception so what you're talking about basically is that your subjective experience what we call consciousness it's a first person subjective experience i don't you know i assume you're conscious but i don't know that you are all i know is my own experience mm. right and mm. then i'm interpreting all these signals and feeling things and i assume you feel things too and so this fundamental question i mean since you know descartes was really questioning is this you know separation between the physical substrate the brain the neurochemicals slushing around and this experience we have this subjective experience which feels immaterial mm. so there's a great philosopher and a friend of mine, Dave Chalmers, who mm -hmm. came up with this term, you know, the hard problem, the easy problem of consciousness. And the mm -hmm. easy problem would say, okay, if we can, which is actually not that easy, because we, we still haven't done it, but if we can map out, if we can correlate every single um, experience that we have with neurons firing in the brain, mm -hmm. we can track, okay, this feeling of seeing red looks exactly like this in your brain. Mm -hmm. And that's a correlation. And that, if we could do that, that would be one thing that's the easy problem. The hard problem is, why is it that these this physical substrate is creating subjective experience? And some philosophers say we might never be able to answer that question. But just because it's hard to answer doesn't mean that it requires a magical explanation. That, you know, some people have likened it to like, oh, so it must be something with quantum physics because quantum physics has <laughs> these mysterious properties and consciousness <laughs> is mysterious, so there must be something there. And so far, there's no real evidence to support that. What do you mean when you say magical? How are you using that term? I think when I say magical, I mean something outside of the physical world that, as as we know it, you know, immaterial, you Metaphys know, a ghost, metaphysical, 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 yeah. Something that we can't perceive. 
I mean, a metaphysical thing would be a sort of social construct, right? I mean, would that be considered metaphysical? Yeah, there are things, I mean, concepts can exist outside of, let's say, physical. But even a concept as you experience it is also tied to neurons firing in your brain. Right. So concepts, would they exist outside of brains experiencing them? Probably not. Well, I think it's also interesting, a distinction too, which I, th- I would assume someone like Deepak Chopra doesn't necessarily view concepts as being some kind of metaphysical thing in in the way that he views consciousness, whereas Plato would have, for example. He would have seen those as the forms. Mm-hmm. So there's this also interesting thing, when so when you bring up sort of this magical and metaphysical, I think and we touched on this a little bit on the phone call that we had before, which is that I think a lot of these sort of theories of minds and questions of consciousness and the seat of consciousness and all this stem from death anxiety. Mm-hmm. I think that people are anxious around the idea of death. Right. I mean, not all people. I, I, I'm one of them, but that <laughs> is what driven me. Well, you have that- an interesting story about that. Why don't you tell our audience about, about your experience with your grandmother? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had a few things. I mean, it started, um, so it was sort of mostly raised by my grandmother who, you know, was closer to death than I guess most parents are to their children. And so she always kind of, I think so from a very early age, you know, she'd sort of be like, I just want you to know, you know, when I'm not here, everything's going to be, and always sort of giving me this idea that she could kind of go at any time. And um, which I think was the root of started my anxiety you know this person who was my main caretaker who I love so much was gonna go and die and what did that mean and so I started thinking about death early on and then there was this time you know I must have been about five years old when I was like sort of riddled with I realized that I was gonna die and that I would no longer exist and how that, old were you said probably around five I think. how did yeah. you make that realization you know, I just, I don't, I just had it. You know, I just thought, said, okay, I, I guess I realized the concept of death. Animals die. My grandmother's going to die. And wait a second, I'm going to die. And what does that mean? That means I'm no longer going to exist. I can't even think to myself anymore. Is that a common, I mean, I'm curious about that it's because not to normal. when is that usually that children sort of reckon with death? It happens at different ages. I think if you've had a traumatic experience or you've come very close to death, it'll probably happen a little bit earlier. I think children understand the concept of death animals die people other things can die but realizing their own mortality it can come in very at various times i think i was a bit young for that to have that real like existential kind of understanding of death you know it's interesting i want to and then i want to let you continue i don't want to interrupt but it makes me think about sort of this process of suppression uh, repression, mm-hmm. rather. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wonder, you know, because you meet many people who say, oh, well, I don't think about this, these philosophical topics, or they're, yeah, they're too deep, I don't really care. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Or do most people have, do the vast majority of people not only have the capacity, but the interest in those things, but they repress them at an early age? So something like the realization that I'm going to die, having that fundamental understanding is something that almost everyone has at a young age, and they repress it? It's hard to, I mean, so repression happens automatically. Um, So suppression is something that happens consciously where you say like, okay, I'm having a fight with my significant other. I'm going to consciously push that away because I know I need to function at work today. So you Mm. can consciously push it into the unconscious. Repression happens automatically. So it's hard to say when it happens because you can have this, maybe this subconscious or almost conscious thought of I am actually going to die and then it's so anxiety provoking that it immediately automatically gets relegated to the unconscious so you might never even fully consciously Mm. experience that thought so there's no you know we can't really say when or if that happens but it does make sense that it is so for many people anxiety provoking until they come to terms with it or come up with some rationalization or come to a religious or spiritual belief that can kind of relieve the anxiety until then it just might fester there in the unconscious so you had this experience at the age of five and then what sort of happened after that so i um i had this moment of okay well i can't even talk to myself in my own head when i'm when i'm dead so then i thought well uh, even if i don't have it was pretty like a profound kind of thing like a darkness eternal darkness yeah nothingness and um so i i said to my father um the next morning who's a physician you know where do my thoughts come from and can i keep them when i die so even if i can't talk to anybody else or have a body or whatever can i at least just have my own inner thoughts which would actually be a nightmare (laughs) right i know (laughs) some people have that who are in a you know completely paralyzed um oh yeah if you ever read the diving bell and the butterfly i have not good book and they made it a film but he 
couldn't move anything except for like blink one eye. And then he came out of that? No, but they were able to communicate with him by just the whole system of blinking his eye. But, but so so he wrote it. So imagine the experience. So he's able to talk about and write about the internal experience of what it feels like to have all your thoughts, but not be able to move a a muscle in your body. So yeah, you're right. It probably would be frightening experience, but maybe sort of in a ghost like where I can kind of move around in this weird you know how you would imagine a ghost would be you don't have to have a body but you can have your thoughts and you isn't can, that what happens if you take too much ketamine you have it's called dissociation where you get this out of body experience yeah you feel disconnected from your body and it is frightening actually um well when I you're know people a, that used to do that for fun yeah I don't think that that was very fun <laughs> Not a very I mean idea. I was a kid in the 90s growing up in New York so I, I oh know. did you what clubs did you go to oh man oh really I went to uh, the limelight of course the limelight was the did place did you go to factory also um, no I went to the tunnel the tunnel <laughs> you remember that yeah oh, I can't remember the rest I just remember I mean the, the the old church the limelight that was now they've turned the, it into like a mall well it was a David Barton gym but David Barton went bankrupt oh they turned so David Barton are you familiar with David, David Barton gym yeah I've heard of it he buys yeah. all these expensive of historic buildings that he cannot possibly monetize into a gym and then went bankrupt. Oh, okay. So he had the limelight and he had the old library at Barnes & Noble and Astor Place. Wow. He turned that into a gym, which was then bankrupt and now New York Sports Club bought it and they're paying, I think, $250,000 a month. Anyway. Oh my God. Yeah. Interjection, but yeah. continue, please. Um, so, uh, so that's you know, interesting, I had my so, yeah, you had your experiences. I lived in the, uh, you know, I lived in the village and I was going to clubs and I had a lot of fun in, the, in those times. It was like rave years. And first it was a bit of rock. I was into the rock scene and like Limeite was like the rock place to go. And I, was, I remember I met Trent Reznor, who was like nine inch nails and all that. And <laughs> then it became sort of more ravey situation <laughs> yeah but yeah special k ketamine yeah. um i remember special that special k special k and now they actually <laughs> use it to treat uh as a treatment for depression so there's trials actually going on at mount sinai where they're using ketamine not in such high doses where you dissociate Obviously. but um to as a treatment for depression it's it's been uh. shown to have some positive results so i do actually want to get yeah. into that with you but um mm-hmm. about depression and anxiety disorder and things like that but right please let's continue. talk about my I anxiety do, i want this I is do, my therapy I, session <laughs> i want to hear more yeah. about your life this is oh, very yeah. interesting. so i um said where do my thoughts come from how can i keep them under and he said well you know they come from your brain and i said okay great so like how so i can figure out how i can keep them if i don't have a brain and he said you know actually he didn't have an answer for me you know we don't we don't exactly know how and so at that moment, I said, that's what I want to try to figure out. Where do my thoughts come from so I can keep them when I die? Or just, you know, how am I having this sort of phenomenal? I couldn't like say it in words at the time, but the mm. real question was, how do I have this phenomenological experience? Mm. And c- can I still have it if I don't have a body? And why is it tied to my body? And um, so, yeah, I remember I wrote like in first grade in your essay, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, oh, so my, I said, dad, what can I be? And he said, well, I guess a psychiatrist from the medical world. <laughs> He's like, first you need yeah, to go to a psychiatrist. I know. <laughs> I know, right? So I wrote my, my essay, I want to be a psychiatrist when I grow up because I want to know where my thoughts come from so I can keep them when I die. And they, of course, sent me like immediately to the school psychologist, um, which was the best thing for, that they could do for me because then I was fascinated by like he was doing all these tests on me and, you know, I was fascinated by this, like, what the psychologist was doing and the psychology of mm. the mind. And then, so it could have went one of two ways. Either I was going to go to like a special school for kids, <laughs> like, you know, but luckily they, they said it was like advanced and they put me in some like enrichment programs, which was great for me. And I got to take courses, classes in psychology when I was only in elementary because school. Because the tests they gave you, they f- discovered that you were advanced? Yeah. I had so, the opposite experience. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. I mean, who knows what this, but I could have really easily gone another way where they were like, she needs help, you know? But yeah. luckily, they they put me in a place where it can enrich my curiosity rather than That's thinking nice. I was weird and different. And oh, yeah, cool. yeah. But um, so but then I got exposure to psychology and the, the you know the science of the mind. And um, so even though I had interest in a lot of other things like the arts as well, and I did like painting and music, I always kept that one theme of like how does the brain work and I want to figure it out and um, that's just led me to where I am today that kind of constant thread and yeah maybe to relieve the anxiety but I still haven't found an answer that relieves it to be honest <laughs> well no I mean I fall in the same category I uh, I mentioned it also because I think I think oftentimes there is an expectation and it's justified I think that mm-hmm. people look for immaterial explanations for consciousness because of the anxiety that consciousness is rooted in the material which we know degrades and disappears right 
And I don't know to what extent that's true in my case. I told you briefly that I have experienced sort of, I had brain surgery. I've been on that operating table right before I was going to go out. No idea what the outcome was going to be. Sheer terror. I mm. definitely had no preconceptions about eternal life or anything. There was no comforting thought. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very, very afraid. So I can't say that I'm not afraid of death and that that may not bias me. It probably does. Mm. But I don't necessarily think that death is a continuation of life in some way or, you know, that that there is any... I have no comforting theory around death mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But just simply the notion that I can make a definitive statement empirically about the nature of my own experience, I find... I haven't been able to be convinced by those arguments, even now when we're talking, because I have absolutely no confidence at all in any of this. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, you know, after my brain surgery, when I had you know, the experience of getting my memories back, which itself was very interesting, but it was an aberrant experience that could fall within the constructions of a sort of materialist view. And in fact, I didn't, I don't necessarily see it as immaterial the way that that happened. Mm -hmm. What I found profound and interesting and enlightening was both the period of re-engagement with the arts and mythology that happened during that period, not just classic mythology, but also the mythology in films like The Matrix or stories like Gattaca or the films of Terrence Malick, The Thin Red Line, things that I loved when I was younger or that I had seen before, but that just didn't speak to me in the same way they were they spoke to me in a completely different way and all of a sudden a religious books myths all those things all carried the sort of universal message that made sense all of a sudden because of this experience that I had and I saw it entirely as metaphorical and the same thing happened to me during my period of radiation it wasn't something where I spoke to God or someone came to me and said hey this is what's going on or you're not going to die or anything like that it was just more that like I realized that there was this authoritative experience that was giving me insight and wisdom and understanding that I could not articulate but that I felt was primary to I don't know how you say that in English. what is the correct terminology it was it is comes before it comes before everything else right yeah so you know that's interesting so there's two sort of views here one is that okay every experience is coming from your brain that you're having and so when you change the brain in any way whether it's ingesting drugs to change your experience or having a brain tumor or you know brain damage stroke all different ways that your brain can be affected it's going to change the way you think because if there's a direct correlation between your brain and how you think and we see that right if somebody gets a specific lesion we can actually go in and we can um, mm -hmm. stimulate different parts of the brain when we're doing cortical mapping let's say to a before person's going to go in for epilepsy epilepsy um, surgery they implant this electric grid and we can stimulate different parts and we can see exactly mm. if we stimulate we can do deep brain stimulation and affect people's emotions and thoughts so we know there's a direct um, there's a causal relationship there. And so when you have a, a tumor that was, it was subcortical, right? It was, it was, I had a craniopharyngioma. It was literally, I, I don't know what the terminology would be if you're, if it's subcortical, it was within this, it was in the center of my brain, right? Pushing up into, into the cognitive areas, into the hypothalamus. So yeah, it was the, it was in subcortical areas, like the evolutionarily older, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like if you took a it's like almost like the earth if you think of it like the brain you go right down into the center into mm -hmm. the core and that's sort of where the tumor was hitting mm. all these primary areas in the brain the thalamus right mm. um which is the relay station all the senses go straight to the thalamus and then it di goes into the cortex so critical parts of the brain that are so like let's say if you damage a part of the cortex a small bit you'll have a little deficit but not much but if you damage I mean, not much, depending if it's a language area, you'll lose your language. That's pretty, pretty bad. But if you have that same size, small lesion, but in one of these subcortical areas, it can cause significant changes. Personality. Personality. Yeah. Um, many things. Emotional I regulation. I had personality changes. <laughs> Emotional regulation. Um, yeah. Motivation. Creativity was also affected for me. Big time. D did it go up or down? down? Down. Big time. I also, you know, it's interesting, Heather, I had... A very interesting experience as well. I'm curious what you mm -hmm. have to say about this. I lost the capacity to, to imagine. Mm. I could not see the future 
in a, in a way that was constructive. I mean, I had sort of fears. I also told you I, I had, and for the audience who may or may not know the people that are joining this conversation, I had anterograde amnesia. I had, mm-hmm. I've read a great deal, including two books on a patient HM. I mm-hmm. did not have, I wasn't exactly like his case. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like a fish exactly, mm-hmm. but I was kind of like, I had absolutely no declarative memory of events that happened, you know, a few minutes before. I had a lingering sense Mm-hmm. that something was wrong that i may have known that this person or the and that gave me tremendous anxiety, anxiety. yeah I mean, that's a lot of people with dementia experience that so when we talk about retrograde versus anterior grade amnesia, retrograde means that you get some sort of head trauma, whatever it may be the incident or a tumor or brain damage, and you can't remember anything before you you can't remember anything from the time of that incident back. But you can form new memories. Yeah, that's retrograde, yeah. That's retrograde, exactly. And what you had was the sort of opposite, anterior grade amnesia, where you had your memories from before, which were kind of solidified. Those are more like hippocampal, long-term memories. Mm -hmm. Um, But you had problem retaining or creating new memories from the time of this going forward. But then you said you regained them. I regained them. So I had, right after the surgery... Uh, as I mentioned to you, mm-hmm. my surgeon was Dr. Greenfield, and you said you're doing some work now there. Yeah, I'm at Cornell in neurosurgery. So he's, he's a there. wonderful shout out to Dr. Greenfield. Actually, I should yeah. I should send this to Dr. Greenfield. Absolutely, Dr. Greenfield, wonderful, wonderful doctor. The only one I was able to find. I went to Sinai. I went to Columbia. I went all over the place. I contacted some people in Pittsburgh, Dana Farber, Harvard. Mm-hmm. Japan. I mean, my right. dad's a physician. Right. We looked everywhere for something. Mm-hmm. And this came out of the blue. In fact, he was introduced to me through Susan Walden, who's a radiation oncologist who did my radiation mm-hmm. at Memorial Sloan. Mm-hmm. And so Dr. Greenfield, amazing, he drilled a hole in my head and burr passed hole. a cath- burr hole yeah. and passed a catheter through my cerebral cortex mm-hmm. and went right through the third ventricle. Nice. And, yeah. you know, Suck this whole thing out. Yeah. And so the the moment this happened, it's a remarkable experience. The moment this happened, I'm, obviously the moment it happened, I was under anesthesia. But my first memory was kind of being positioned in the burn ICU because they mm. ran out of, they put me in the burn ICU, which is, uh, let me tell you something. Oh, if God. you're recovering from a brain tumor and dementia, the last place you want to be in is burn ICU. Yeah. I didn't write anything about that story. In fact, I've never publicly talked about it. That's a whole nother ball of Unbelievable. wax. Unbelievable. Yeah. Those people are, it's torture. They're, be, oh. Scary. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. no one told me I was in burn ICU. You oh, know that? Oh, man. <laughs> no one told me. I found out about it because there was a chemical fire one morning. The, ne- the next, that next morning, like <gasps> 2 a.m., so there was a chemical fire in Queens and they were bringing Everybody all these- Everybody came in in emergency. Oh, God. <laughs> Very yeah, that's no, traumatic. It, it traumatic. Was, it was so. Th- it's yeah. interesting though, bec- but it's relevant mm-hmm. because the moment I was I uh, came out of surgery, had I not had the brain surgery, had it not been successful, I'd have had no concept of where I was and how what just happened really. But I did. But I wasn't aware of the significance of that in that moment. Mm-hmm. But what happened was I was fully able. My, I immediately looked at my father and I did remember, you know, to ask him, I said, what happened? And I, he, he told me and I put it all together and he saw that. I mean, immediately the, cause it wasn't just interrogate amnesia that I had. I had other problems. I didn't, couldn't tell you the president, couldn't tell you my birthday. Mm-hmm. I was on an airplane months before that going to Los Angeles for to be in a documentary, which I was in and looked normal, mm-hmm. except, except for the fact that I was completely, you know, scruffled and unkempt and looked like a wild man, I think in my mm-hmm. opinion, but I was lucid seemingly forgot where I was going on the airplane. This was mm-hmm. months before my surgery. Mm-hmm. So, Well, I'm also, because, you see, this tumor that was growing in the sort of core, you know, subcortical area of your brain was causing pressure on the cortical areas, right? So when you say, like, you couldn't think into the future, part of the brain has to do with, like, future forward thinking is the prefrontal cortex and also short-term memory, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So even though your prefrontal cortex didn't have the tumor in it, it seems to me that this pressure that was being put on your brain from having this subcortical tumor that was rather large, I mean, I saw an image of it actually in this piece it was you wrote large. on it. Yeah, which pressing on your cortical areas, probably causing these more cortical-type problems of memory, you know, working memory, probably attention problems I'm imagining you were having. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I did. Lo- I lost my sense of time. I would. I would also began smoking 
incessantly. Well, impulse control. You know what's really interesting? I actually, one of some of my research was in time perception, and I found that the orbital prefrontal cortex, part of the, the most ventral part of the prefrontal cortex, is involved in time perception as well as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So a lot of my prefrontal cortex patients who were impulsive, they had actual lesions to the prefrontal cortex, were impulsive, lacked emotional regulation, and had time perception problems. So that makes sense. I just, yeah. so you're saying that. So two things. I just want to mention, another thing I did incessantly was play Tetris, which is, you know, a fascinating thing. Mm. I worked in television. I had a television show before this that I created and ran. And uh, it was a beyond full-time job. Mm. I slept three hours. It was insane. And the summer before, my, my symptoms became obvious in January of 2013. The summer before that, I began playing Tetris, which is just, you know, for me, you know, like we, mindless, weird. Why? Yeah, like why We'd you... sit during production, during the rundown meetings where we're going through the rundown, where we're going for the, through, through prep for the show, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting there wheeling around in my chair playing Tetris. Right. Um, and and that to me, you know, I went through my emails to kind of, you know, after I wrote that story because I was working on something else, and I went through my emails trying to find when did the dementia begin. I don't have any clear evidence that it began then. In fact, the, the sort of the clearest evidence I really have was that it began right after I entered entered the show. But you know, anyway, it is a weird thing. And the, the when the reason I I, I say that is because I played it incessantly from then mm -hmm. until the day of my surgery. After my surgery, I never played it again, and mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of the fact that I hadn't played. But until about a month or two afterwards, I was like, wait a minute, I haven't played Tetris. And you bring up time. I was sitting in my therapist's office after my surgery mm -hmm. and I'm looking at him and I'm looking at the clock and you want to talk about being high. It mm -hmm. felt like I was higher than I'd ever been in my life. The time was passing so slowly mm -hmm. after my surgery because of that perceptual difference mm -hmm. before was time was just so flying. Yeah. Exactly. And then in, in retrospect, you know, it's, it's all relative, right? I mean, our perception of time is relative. And so actually, when you really sit down and measure it, you know, I've done experiments with this and healthy people where everything's okay with the brain actually have a slower subjective sense of time compared to the real clock time. So we, if I say, you know, hmm. let's say it's been a minute exactly if I time it, I say, okay, how much time has passed? You'll likely, you'll make an estimate, oh, it's been like... Um, you know, like you'll say something like less than a minute. You'll under, mm. you'll overproduce and underestimate. So if I say to you, read these numbers on the screen and stop when you think it's been a minute, you'll probably go a little bit longer, like a minute 20, and you'll feel like that's been a minute. Or if I tell you to estimate, you'll underestimate. This means we have a slower subjective sense of time than the actual real time. And people who are impulsive or who have a faster subjective sense of time, actually are closer to the real time. So when you say healthy, you mean people that are sort of... Don't have any brain damage or, you know, um, <laughs> the average... I'm saying like a person, a brain that's a healthy brain. If, what if you're OCD? Um, Does time pass quickly? Interestingly, Is I, that why Woody Allen is so afraid of dying because everything's moving so fast? <laughs> <laughs> OCD is a little bit like the opposite of impulsivity. I look oh. at impulsivity as like, you know, I need that that one marshmallow now I can't wait till later oh, and it's not just addictive like personalities well it's sort of like you can't wait for a reward despite what the negative consequences might be mm. and but so I started looking at it's not just about reward sensitivity like I want that marshmallow now I can't wait for two but it's also subjective sense of time waiting might feel subjectively much longer to them like mm. waiting five minutes might feel like an eternity because their time is going so so sort of subjectively quickly in their in their mind they have a faster uh -huh. subjective sense of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want think you can't wait as long. So it's not just wanting the reward, but also not being able to tolerate the waiting. OCD is a little bit different. So impulsivity and time perceptual problems have underactivation of the orbital prefrontal cortex. OCD is overactivation. So you're perseverating, you're overthinking, right. you're going over and over and over again. So it's a little bit different. Right, which is why it's interesting. It's like it, an over control versus under control. Is, and how does that relate to spectrum autism disorders? So there's some overlap between autism spectrum disorders and OCD symptoms in terms of the, you know, perseveration. There's some overlap between this. Too. Like I was actually working in a lab at Mount Sinai where I was looking at impulsive and compulsive disorders. And another part of the lab was looking at autism spectrum. And there was a lot of overlap between the two. But they're they're different. You know, autism is a different. It's related to sort of a different genetic. We were starting to find the genes that are related to autism and the genes that are related to like OCD. And so they're different diseases, you would say, of the brain, or I don't want to pathologize it, but you know they have different underlying etiologies or causes. And ultimately, the symptomology, there is some overlap. You know so much. 
<laughs> no, no, I, I feel like everything I ask you, you have so much to say. Right. So that, okay. that makes me... But go. what I wanted to say is that when you have these changes in the brain, so it can give you sort of religious or existential experiences. So there's people who have temporal lobe epilepsy where they get problems in their temporal lobe, which it seems that you had some temporal lobe problems as well with where your tumor was and the effects on your memory. Yeah, I, I had a lot of problems. I okay. still do. Um, but <laughs> they actually get these, sometimes become hyper-religious when they have temporal lobe epilepsy. Well, explain, okay, so you're drawing now a line from OCD to... Temporal lobe epilepsy. No, uh, what I'm saying is that your your experience that you said uh, when you had this tumor and after you had this sort of like experience of there was this thing that came before and everything made sense like the matrix. It felt like all. revelation. Right, right. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So that feeling, that sort of, some people interpret that as as becoming more religious then because they have these sort of. I don't know what you want to call them existential experiences. Authority, like knowledge that I didn't learn. Okay, like an, it's an experience. That's basically an experience. If you didn't learn it through, I would. It's so difficult to describe. You, you know, feel we did, it to be true. You know it to be true. Yes, I know it to be true without having learned it. Got it. Right. Which is the weirdest thing right. and makes no sense. Right. But that's that's the best way I could describe. Right. It. So it's like a revelation. That's why all this sort of religious mythology and religious language and metaphor all of a sudden made sense. It was like, oh my god, yes, right. I understand exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. So either there are two explanations. One is that it's true. Like you had this revelation. Now you have the secret knowledge about how everything exists. No, I mean, that's what some people take that it's definitely explanation. definitely not a secret knowledge. I, mean, okay. I, wish, I wish it were so good. Um, but, you know, that there's some other, you know, underlying truth that we, you know, only can understand via this revelation. Or mm, I think that might be true. Okay. Okay. I think that might be true. Some people All say right. that. Me and Deepak might be in the same camp. That's on that. right. You might be. <laughs> or we can say it's just actually an experience that you have that was related to changes in your brain and we can simulate those experiences so there's a way that you can actually stimulate the parts of the temporal lobe and cause people to have those experiences as well so there's two explanations again some would say oh that's the god module in the brain so that this the is the pineal what, gland uh, not even the no pineal i know gland, but, but that's I mean, what yeah, 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 yeah. yeah some used a long time ago Cartesian. said that you yeah said the pineal gland is where well, people still say that a lot of yogis here in new york city say oh that. yeah I they're working on their pineal gland right <laughs> antiquated idea but Yes, but but basically, the, some would say that this temporal—it's called like temporal parietal um, junction, or where you can stimulate and have these experiences, or if you have temporal epilepsy, you have these experiences. So some describe that, oh, that's the place in the brain that God like communicates hmm. to you, or that's you know why if you stimulate it, you have these experiences, or it could just be that it's an, an experience caused by different types of brain activation, which. You know, you change the brain, you change your experience. I think anyone that makes the argument, when 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 someone makes the argument, uh, attempts to sort of make such an argument that this is the seat of divinity in the brain, or people that say, like, you know, we can prove life after death by seeing, like, what happens, like, people have experiences. I don't think that, that I think that's like following the rabbit hole of materialism with to try to create... It's like trying to create an empirical explanation to explain a non-empirical phenomena. I mean, I, I don't think that makes any sense at all. Right. I do hear what you're saying. I mean, I think, look, I mean, it's a... Uh, this is the thing. It's like, how do you... I mean, this is, is getting a little bit in deep territory, but he, you know, it's sort of like <laughs> his knowledge... <laughs> well, his knowledge of, <laughs> like, consciousness just existed. It's immaterial, right? And you can... Uh, I say, well, how did you attain that knowledge? Like, how do you know that? Because he... And he's just saying, well... If you get to higher, like maybe it could be a meditation or whatever, you can get to these higher levels of understanding and knowing and experiencing. And look, you don't need language to to experience these feelings, conscious to be conscious, right? You don't need your sense of self. You don't even need a personality, right? Just to experience a feeling like or seeing the color red. But we do know that those experiences are tied to very specific functions in the brain. And when you knock out those functions, you knock out those experiences. So as a scientist, I think they're intricately tied. Let's do a thought experiment. Okay. You've watched The Matrix, right? Of course. You've seen all three? I don't even remember the order. Yeah, probably, yes. Okay, so I've talked about this so many times on the show. Okay. Like so many times. I literally, every time I talk about it, I always have to apologize to the audience because I feel like 
I'm mm-hmm. that guy that always talks about The Matrix. And I'm going to be like that old man on the bench talking about it. Right. So I had seen The Matrix, the first one, when I was young, when, in, mm-hmm. in 1999 when it came out. Mm-hmm. And then the second one I saw, and I was like, eh, that's not very exciting. And then I didn't even bother watching the third one. Mm-hmm. After my surgery, I watched The Matrix, all three, and I was blown away. Like, I was... Also, I cried a lot after my, and I still do now. Mm-hmm. Not as much, but like that's one of the the only things that's endured. Like I could, mm. it, I could even cry at a commercial. Right. Like if it's a really you know deep commercial, like mm-hmm. my capacity to. That's s- like me pregnant. Oh yeah. Well, they, they, <laughs> these commercials. Well, like, why relate, am I crying? I relate, this card commercial. <laughs> I relate with pregnant women. <laughs> okay. I related more with them, obviously, after my surgery. Mm-hmm. So. I was able to see things. So many things there. I mean, I could sit and we could talk about that all day. But let's put that aside for a moment and just let's let's play with the thought experiment of the matrix, mm-hmm. which is that if you if you are in the matrix, how would you know that you are not in the matrix? And from a if and, and let's take it very very literally. Even though I'm not saying that we're being controlled by machines, but let's go that literal route, mm-hmm. which is that we're in a material world. Mm-hmm. And you are put under anesthesia, some kind of you know anesthesia, whatever it is, and you have a simulation running in your brain that's being controlled by a computer. Mm-hmm. This is all within physical, physically possible. This is all physically possible. We can theorize. I mean, we can't do it right now, but I'm sure we could run. Mm-hmm. We could do that. And you think that you are living in 1999, New York City, but you're not. The thing is, it is a simulation. Like what we experience as reality is sort of a simulation sure it's it's so and and we can manipulate it i can manipulate you know if it would the more the only thing that's blocking us is our understanding of how the brain works the more we understand it the more we can manipulate it and change your whole perspective i mean even now with vr you know you can put people in different places and feel like it's real it'll just get realer and realer life is like that it's like a virtual reality for us so then the, the only question is is there an actual reality that exists independent of our experience right yes uh, yeah i mean yes if that, your that if your reality my... is is a simulation like in the matrix right yes but is there something if you weren't in them if you weren't experiencing the things in the matrix would there be an independent reality that still exists outside of that simulated experience that you're having? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And it's interesting because the Matrix is a great example also because something I didn't understand before my surgery, which was the Matrix was not just the Matrix. It turned out that everything was the Matrix. And you figure that out with the third one, which is that the whole world that they thought was real was also a Matrix. Mm. So it's it's Matrix all the way up and down. Mm-hmm. And it makes you question your own reality, right? But the thing is, if this was a uh, somebody you know created it, then who? And you know. Well, let's put that aside. Okay. I'm not even <laughs> saying that. I'm saying I'm saying how can you make it an empirically definitive statement mm-hmm. about the nature of reality when you're living in a matrix? We are limited by our brain that's here to interpret the world. We Some more limited in. than others. <laughs> 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 True that. No pun intended, you know. And no, I you know, mean, it speaks to the point. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we <laughs> are given this piece of material, whatever it is, to experience the world we find ourselves in. And that's limited, right? We have a limit. I mean, some people say that us understanding consciousness or the world we're in, whatever, is like an ant trying to understand calculus. It's just like beyond our <laughs> comprehension, <laughs> you know. Exam. But what we have is what we have. And so we find ourselves in this world and we say, well, what's the most objective way I can try to ask questions and understand it? And they create the scientific method to insert objectivity, right? To try to get away from the subjectivity, which has a sort of a system of checks and balances and revises itself. And this is our only, the way we've created to try to understand at least what we have as truth, what's around us. This is the world, who knows? I mean, this could all be nothingness, but... There we agree. So I agree with you. So here's what I think you're saying, and this is what I would say, which is that uh, science, the empirical method, and all of these uh, technologies of the mind that we've developed allow us to approximate reality or to be better able to predict, because that's what a model is all about, the future. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can do that more effectively, good. But to use those tools to make a definitive statement or to make any statement of any type of reliable statement about the nature of consciousness itself and the nature of experience and of being, I think falls 
outside the model. It's it doesn't work. You see, what you're saying is that we can't measure subjectivity, or we can't we can't we can't experiment that we can't measure it. And I I disagree with that. I don't think it's outside the framework of the model. Well, I'm not saying that we. Well, I don't I don't think I'm saying that. Okay. Maybe 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 I am. But well, let me try to restate it. I do think you can measure all these things. I think, in other words, I'm not taking a solipsistic idea of the world. I'm not saying that when you put electrodes in my brain and you see things, that those things, you're not seeing those things, those things aren't real, but they are the shadows of something. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that something is what we tr we're trying to definitively talk about when we talk about theories of mind, we're talking about consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's the hard problem, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that, can only present the reverberations. We experience the phenomena of of whatever the core of reality is. So how can we make a definitive statement about that? When again, within the all the models we're using right now, I literally could be asleep and there could be actually a God operating a machine or I could be Truman in the Truman Show and that would actually fall within a completely logical analysis based on the mm -hmm. empirical method. Mm -hmm. No. Well, so the what you're experiencing. Feel free to mock I, no, my. No, feel free okay. to mock my ideas. No, no I, I love like this. I love having you in studio. This is amazing. I haven't had a, a guest to have this type of. I literally just. This is totally what? useless. I created a rundown, but it's totally useless. Really? Oh. Oh, I usually go off these things, but right. uh, no, this is great. I decided to, I decided to forget. <laughs> we're going it. off the rails. Um, we're tearing up the script here, Doctor <laughs> Berlin. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's. One explanation is that you can say we're living in this this simulation and nothing, you know, then no, nothing. I mean, like also according to Deepak, like matter doesn't exist. It's only here because we're experiencing it as we've created matter, but it's consciousness is immaterial and all this stuff. But again, this gets us nowhere, right? We still find ourselves in this world having these experiences, okay? And if we want to try to understand them, the best tool we have is the scientific method. There Now, consciousness always used to be relegated to the realm of only philosophers can talk about that. And then in, it was around 1994, Francis Crick, co-discoverer of DNA, decided after discovering what the, the building, you know, the key to life, basically, wanted to then tackle this problem of consciousness and understanding the neural basis of consciousness. And he wrote this book, The Astonishing Hypothesis. And then began to collaborate with someone named Christoph Koch, who's a neuroscientist, and legitimized the field of the scientific study of consciousness, like saying, look, we can actually try to use a scientific method to study this thing, which is supposedly untouchable. And there's a whole field now. You know, I encourage you to go to these conferences, the Association of the Scientific Study of Consciousness, and you'll see that we are devising ways. Now, look, it's still a hard thing because it is subjective. And the larger question of, you know, is this all not real and is it all created by something is sort of not relevant to the question at hand. It's like saying, you know, are you going to get into a car crash, right? That's like a real material thing, right? You're going to let's just say like a, something that's happening here on the whether it's a simulation or not you know what you're going to experience pain sure you might lose a leg i agree with all that you know so <laughs> there's some realities at least in our simulation that sure have real world consequences in the world that we're living in and if it's all a matrix that's fine but it still doesn't we're still living in it yes and there's still lots of questions that can be answered within that yes um so i think it's just sort of defeated to say well it's all you know it, it, you know, no, what right. I'm saying is that if this is a video, if I'm playing Call of Duty, right, I need to know how to play Call of Duty. I need to be really good at that. And so I'm going to study the maps and I'm going to learn all the mm -hmm. tricks and everything else. And that's what matters. What doesn't doesn't matter how to bake an egg. Uh, what matters is I want to play Call of Duty. I got to be the best at Call of Duty. Right. I'm in this whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I develop models and theories to help me navigate and excel in this matrix. Mm -hmm. But to make a definitive statement about anything at the core, all I'm saying is that I agree with everything you're saying. Right. I'm okay. just saying that I don't see how any of those tools allow me to make the definitive statement about where I reside or where where I am or the nature of this or if there is life after death or what life is so or those, those questions, core. Listen, yeah. So I once went to this meeting. It was actually at the House of Lords in, in the UK, in London, and 
where Sounds they fancy. Very fancy. Very fancy. I was invited by a Baroness. <laughs> do they have tea? Baroness and Greenfield. Tea yes, they do. They do indeed. Do they call um, them crumpets? <laughs> <laughs> that would yes. be amazing. So actually, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Susan Greenfield, is a neuroscientist in the UK, interested in these questions of consciousness, and was made a Baroness by Tony Blair, so a member of the House of Lords. And she organized this meeting of neuroscientists, philosophers, psychologists, and religious leaders to ask the question, if we can understand the neural basis of consciousness, what would that mean for the concept of a soul? And so we had these discussions, we presented our research and ideas and came to the conclusion that basically this idea of this eternal soul, at least the way the religious leaders had explained it, was outside the realm of scientific, you know, we can't touch it either way. We can't prove it or disprove it. And that's the realm you're kind of talking about. It's sort of like, yeah, I can't I can't say to you whether there's life after after death definitively. You know, I just haven't seen any evidence for it, but maybe that's just the way it's designed. They'll, they'll never give us material evidence for some immaterial afterlife. And that would be great. Like, look, I'm all for that. You know, I'm not trying to... Or maybe not. Depends on depends on what... I know, I know. That's true. What it looks like. <laughs> true indeed. It could suck. But... um. I, you know, I, the thing is, I actually am against, so my husband is a, is a very like staunch atheist and, you know, and I always say, well, how do you know? Like this definitive thing of like, I know there is no God. I know that right. I'm not as presumptuous to know that. I just say, look, as far as I can see, there's no evidence for that. But so there wouldn't be any evidence. Maybe not. And so that's where belief comes in. And, and I'm open to say like, maybe there is something else. Like, I mean, it is pretty amazing that we find ourselves here in this universe. It's amazing that the brain could organize itself in such a way or, you know, was organized by someone or whatever. This piece of matter that's so small compared to like, let's say the enormity of the universe in terms of mass and matter. Yet it can comprehend itself and its place in the universe. That's amazing. Can it comprehend itself and its place in the universe? Well, I mean, that, what it I'm has saying, a imagine. concept of that. But at you least. know, but like you would agree, for example, that your comprehension of the universe exceeds orders of magnitude more than a dog, and mm-hmm. you know, genetically, the dog is what like ninety percent. Yeah, I mean, DNA? I'm sure that I mean, there's that we don't know much, but this is the best we have. Again. Exactly. Again, but right. back to that point. And, but it's still just because of the fact that we are limited in our understanding. And as you said, some people some more people than others. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> there's a lot of individual vari- you know, variation amongst us all. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, some people are who are geniuses and who, who have great insights, you know, like Einstein, whoever, who maybe have even a greater understanding of how things work than, than us, you know, mere mortals or whatever. But... <laughs> That doesn't mean, just because we might have a feeble understanding, doesn't mean that there is necessarily something else, no. right? So no. we just don't know. Exactly. I think and that's, I'm open to that to say we don't know. I yeah. think that's the intellectually honest thing. I think, again, that brings me back to my point, which is that when someone tries to prove that there's an afterlife or to ha- pr- propose a concrete sort of theory, I'm always sort of like, I don't feel comfortable with this. Because like, I just think that, 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 again, that to me is you know intellectually dishonest. What do you think about artificial intelligence and all the conversations that are happening around Mm -hmm. the integration of theory of mind and this sort of applied philosophy? I'm not sure if you, I wouldn't be surprised if you have. Have you read Nick Bostrom's work? No. Um, What has he written? So he is the head of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. Okay. He's written a book called Superintelligence. Okay. And uh, he's the best I've found. In fact, he's the guy that Bill Gates and... uh, and Elon Musk quote regularly. In fact, Bill Gates oh, has the best review ever mm-hmm. on his book cover, jacket cover. It literally just says, I highly recommend this book, Bill Gates, which I no, think is- No, I the, love that. <laughs> that's all you need. What else do you need? What <laughs> well, else? when you're Bill Gates, you exactly. can just say that. I highly Nuff recommend said. this book. That's it. You Boom. You should have just said, enough said. That's yeah, it. drop the mic. So, um, he, What's his name, Bolton? No. Um, um, uh, Nick Bostrom. Bostrom. Nick Bostrom. Nick Bostrom. So- I heard Nick for the first time, and our audience knows this because I sing Nick's praises. I heard Nick speak for the first time on a different podcast called The Partially Examined Life. Are you familiar with that? That I've heard. It used to be really good. Yeah. I, I'm not like I don't feel it like that much anymore, but like I don't really listen to it anymore because it got too pedantic. Mm-hmm. But it used to be just more for you know, it was just you know, broader sort of non-academic philosophical thinking, and they brought him on. And he talked about artificial intelligence engineering Mm -hmm. as applied philosophy. Mm -hmm. And this this thing where we have these philosophical debates that you and I can have here and never resolve, Mm -hmm. that people have been having forever, Mm -hmm. but all of a sudden now we need to resolve them. We need to code them. Mm -hmm. We need to code values. We need to do all of this. Mm -hmm. And to me, without, you know, being presumptuous, I must say I can't 
see how I'm ever, ever going to be convinced that this is a good idea. Not that, not saying that we can prevent us going down the road of sort of creating super intelligence, mm -hmm. but I, where I see the issue, and I'll mm -hmm. let you talk now because I feel like I'm just mm -hmm. talking, okay. is, which I do all the time, which is why I have a podcast, mm -hmm. <laughs> so is sort of this alignment or this possible misalignment of goals between the machines mm -hmm. and super intelligent machines and us. And no matter what we attempt to do, because we can't answer these basic questions of what is a good life? Mm -hmm. What is happiness? You know, what do we want? What do I want? People don't even know what they want. People walk around every day and they're like, I don't know what I want. How, I don't, how am right. I going to be happy? <laughs> how are we going to program intelligent machines to align with goals that we ourselves don't understand? That's a really good question. You know, there's a couple of things with AI. And actually, I, have, I haven't seen the new Blade Runner movie, but I'm very excited for Really? That. You think it's going to be good? Is it good? I, I've heard I've it's heard, better than people thought it would be. I heard it's good. I'm going to see it tomorrow. So I'll I like Ryan Gosling. get back to you on that. He's yeah. cool. I like him. But, you know, that idea of, you know, at some point, are we going to be able to tell the difference? Right. And that's the classic kind of Turing test. But so, look, I think that the, let's say, you know, simulations or computer technology already more intelligent in many ways than we are, right? They can do mathematical problems much quicker and faster and better and, you know, solve algorithms, all these things that it depends on how you measure intelligence, right? I think a lot of the stuff with the machine learning is really interesting now that you kind of program it and then it learns on its own mm. the way that we do, the way a brain actually mm. works. And one interesting thing is that the bugs that we have in our brain. So like when I say bugs, like things like visual, like illusions that we have, you know, cause the brain, it's not a perfect representation of reality. Right. And so there's these little bugs that we can play with when we do that with illusions and this bugs that are in our brain are different than that's how we might be able to tell the difference between AI and us, their bugs in their programs will be different than our bugs. If that makes sense. No, not exactly. Okay, so <laughs> the glitches, glitches. Okay. The little glitches we have in our brain, which right. we do, which I, I said can be revealed with these visual What's an illusions? example of a glitch in our brains? Here. Do you have it on this piece of paper here? Oh, I've seen these you. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The I shadow think I do illusion. Have them. Here, yeah, yeah, here's the, the shadow, shadow illusion. illusion. Or like the this thing, the sex thing, which I couldn't see. And oh, I you had, couldn't see that? I couldn't see it, but when you pointed it out, then I saw it. Now I see it. Right. I can't unsee it. You can't unsee I it. I can't unsee now it. Now it's there always, forevermore. Um, but, you know, our <laughs> brain plays tricks on us, basically, because it's programmed that way. Or unconscious biases that we have um, sure. that play themselves out in different ways. Yeah. So those kind of things that we can play with, in, when you understand the brain more, you can kind of play with these tricks when we know where the sort of little glitches are, blind spots, you want to call them maybe, Um the ones that AIs will have will be slightly different than the ones brain. So they're they're not made exactly the way our brains work, right? They're different. Anyway, the point is that if they can be more intelligent than us and do things better and quicker, and, but will they be conscious is the question. Will they have subjective experience? That matters because you can kick your refrigerator now, right? Because right. you don't think it has feelings. But if it's an it's you know advanced refrigerator, if whether it has a feeling, whether it can feel that or not, will make a difference <laughs> on how we treat them. It's I know, true. no, I'm familiar. Look, I'm familiar, yeah. I'm familiar with this. This, Go ahead. Sorry. So so I think that's the big question where it's going to get into the ethics of things. Not whether they're going to be these super brains, which they probably will be able to process many things greater than us. But yeah, can they experience love, emotion, pain? And that's where our values come from. So even though we can't articulate our values, what makes us happy, what makes us, what do we want, what are our goals? We do feel things. We feel unhappy. We can feel unhappy. We know what makes us happy when we feel happiness, like, oh, that thing makes me happy. So I guess we can program those models into these machines, but will they actually feel them? Will they actually experience subjective experience? And that's the big question. Now, I met with this thing called Saifu Camp at Google, and they had um, Larry Schmidt and, and Sergey. They, they invited a bunch of scientists and tech people to their Google campus for a weekend to have these discussions. And I met with them, and, I, and I, we were talking about AI and like Marvin Mansky was there and all these amazing really, people. Cool. And they, I said, well, would it be conscious? And then they just said, well, we don't care. That's not our, that's what we care about. Mm. And that kind of what disturbed me. What do they care me. about? Did they answer that question? <laughs> See, that's the important yeah. question to ask. Yeah. What do you care about? What is the goal of the it's, engineer? It's, it's making predictions. That's the scary it's part. Not, it's not whether it, it has feelings or not. And that really blew me away because I, that was sort of like, well, that's the only thing I care about. Right. Whether you can create. You care about that. That's well, interesting. I, yeah, I care about if you create these simulate these AIs and whatever, do they have feelings? That's important for my for, for ethics, for the way everything's going to go. Also, if we're worried, are they going to like do a hostile takeover? 
Well, if they have empathy, maybe they won't. You got to read Bostrom's book. I You're going to love it. It's okay. going to it's going to be super super awesome for you to read. You're going to really enjoy it because right. what Nick Bostrom does you have to really sort of devote the time to it. Mm -hmm. But what he does is he brings you down these thought experiments where you realize that actually the malevolent outcomes don't require malevolence. And that that's the the point of the sort of the, the notion of goal alignment, that you can have perverse instantiations of the goals that you've set for the AI. Yes. The AI can think that it's it's what it's doing is it's you told yes. it maximize human happiness. And so mm -hmm. it figures the best way to do that is we put electrodes in your brain right. and we stimulate this and then you're forever happy. Or we lobotomize you because we realize that you guys overthink too much. You know what's a great, if we're going down the film way, but a great film that, that shows that exact concept is that one with Will Smith. Oh, what was it? It was it was like an AI film with Will Smith. I can't remember the name of it, but it sort of at the end. Don't you remember there was these like uh, I wish somebody oh, was here to you know something with the about. robots. The yeah, ro with the iRobot. Robot. I iRobot. Thank I you. Robot, which is now like a, a vacuum cleaner, isn't it? Right. <laughs> well, the iRobot film. <laughs> I, I don't want to give it away, but it's it's a pretty Please old do. film. Please okay. do. I don't think it was that great. But at the end, <laughs> no, that was, it wasn't that great. But this concept was the this super kind of computer who's controlling everything at the end. Um, is trying to destroy all humans. You know, they, the robots basically turn against them. And even mm. though they were programmed to be benign and all right. that, and the, her thing was that I was here to maximize. It was something like, you know, the best outcomes or something for. The, and basically, humans are the worst things for the Earth, right? Because mm. exactly. if you really do that calculation, what's in our best interest actually is to just get rid of us because we're actually causing all these problems. And it was, so it was like this sort of logical calculation that was based on the goals that were programmed into this computer. But in the end, it came out, oh, we need to get rid of all of humanity because that's the most, you know, that would be, give us the best outcome. Yeah. So. And so he does this. He also gives other examples where the, it doesn't necessarily misunderstand the goal, but it maximizes that. So like the, cl the classic example is the Sorcerer's Apprentice in Fantasia, mm -hmm. where Mickey creates the brooms to, to, to uh, I mean, creates the, uh, the brooms and the buckets, not the brooms, the mops and the buckets to sort of wash the floor. Mm -hmm. And the, they're basically an algorithm that runs to wash the floor oh, yeah, and they and don't they stop. And, they, and the, the whole <laughs> world becomes broomsticks and, and right. water. So, I mean, that's very interesting. And, and in that context, I've thought the way that we should approach the problem again with great humility because i'm not an engineer mm -hmm. but like to me what makes sense is this notion of parasite and host mm -hmm. that we want to develop an ai that is a host organism and sees us as a bene beneficent parasite and mm -hmm. that should be sort of which would allow sort of the flexibility for us to live around this super organism that's mm -hmm. going to do whatever it's going to do well i mean we're already sort of in those relationships oh, not not explicitly but we we use our iPhones. We use our, we are kind of the, I don't know how we're helping them. We're slaves. Yeah, we are pretty much slaves. We're slaves. So I don't know stuff. where we're going to, we're going to program into them why they need us. That's the tricky part. But I guess we can come up with something. We're really controlled. I'm sure, you know, oh, yeah. uh, you, you would have, you must have, uh, you must, of all the people I've ever had on the show, you must have the deepest insights and thoughts around the extent to which our agency is controlled by the technology and the algorithms mm -hmm. that run in the cloud of Facebook and Google and all mm -hmm. of these social media I've companies. actually, I have this fight with my husband. It's a literal, like, he wants Alexa and he, we have the Alexa and I say- No way. Thank you very no much. No way. Tell him absolutely, tell him no. I did. And now what my- What was his name again? Baba, Baba. Tell Baba no. <laughs> no Baba. He's going to have to hear this. <laughs> Baba. It's funny. His I name is support. Baba and the, and the kids will call him Baba. Right. Because Baba means father or wise one in, well, Indian Sanskrit. That was actually, he, his real name is actually Dirk, but when he was born, his parents were kind of these hippies, and they said, Dirk. He, Dirk, <laughs> it's Dutch. He's Dutch. His father is Dutch. And so he said, <laughs> he was born with this contemplative look on his face, uh, and he didn't cry, whatever. They said, oh, he's a baba. And they just named him that, and that stuck. But my daughter, I see her saying, Alexa, play this, play this. And I'm, I'm so just, there's something in my gut that tells me that is not right. Tell Baba that his parents were hippies. He should know better. He shouldn't be yes. putting Alexis in the house. Thank, thank you very much. But anyway, yeah, I see it. I see it happening all the time. People are being zombified and it's, and it's scary. So then people say, oh, you're a technophobe, whatever. No, I said, like, look, this has, there are advantages that we have from this. Obviously, I mean, I use the internet. I use, you know, I have my iPhone, but we have to, we have to be really cognizant of how it's affecting us and put, and I think we need to put limits on it. Just like, alcohol use, drug use. 
there's internet addiction now, you know, and I, there's patients who, and it activates the same parts of the brain as drug addiction. And so we really need to be cautious and observe our own behavior and, and moderate it. I think definitely like, I mean, you're a parent, so you, you have more insights on this. So I'm sure there is some way to control, to control it on some level, but I wonder to what extent you can control it. You know, before we end, I mm-hmm. want to ask you something because you mentioned this, this point of impulsivity mm-hmm. and, uh, you mentioned something in your work that I that that resonated with me, which had to do with success mm-hmm. and sort of the relationship between success and impulse control. Mm. And you know, one of the things I've said to myself and to others is that anyone, if I have children, I hope to, at some point in my life, I think that the greatest thing that a child can have in this world today, especially, is the capacity to control impulses, to have self control. Mm -hmm. because of the fact that we live in a more stimulative environment than we ever have. But what I thought was interesting and why I mentioned is because you wrote or you said maybe Mm -hmm. perhaps multiple times that already, you know, or for, you know, millennia or whatever, it's always been the case that success is highly correlated to impulse control. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm kind of, you know, messing with what you said, but maybe you could talk about that a bit. And then I just want to ask also what makes a genius. Oh, okay. Oh, that's all. Uh, Well, that's it. We don't have to go too far. um, They they basically did all these measures about what predicts future life success. Lots of tests with young kids. And they found that the single greatest predictor of future life success in all areas, job attainment, you know, marital happiness, body mass index, was this simply this marshmallow test, which is a test of impulse control, where you say you can have one marshmallow now, or you can wait and have two marshmallows later. And there's these great videos that were done where they want these kids, you know, some of them just sit there perfectly nice and they wait for the other and some are just struggling and, ah, uh, and you know, because they hidden camera in them. And then, you know, it's great if you ever go online to watch these videos and some just can't even, they just right away take it. But, you know, the so you see all these individual differences between them. And really what it is I th- is a, a measure of, of prefrontal cortex function, of executive function. And that is the thing that predicts, like, so, if, you know, do you, should you want to sit home and study now and have that kind of self-control? Or you want to go out and party? You know, and those kinds of things will lead to greater life success overall. So impulse control, in a sense, is a is a litmus test for prefrontal cortex function, which which helps predict that. But on the flip side of that, there are certain points where it's good to decrease that prefrontal cortex function to let go. It's not good to be overly controlled all the time. It's not good to be always let go and, and impulsive and you can't control it. But if you have the ability to switch it on and off, because creativity, we're looking in the brain now and when people are being spontaneously creative, you know, I did some neuroimaging with my husband doing freestyle rap and there's some studies that show that when you're freestyling or when you're doing jazz improv, you actually get decreased activation parts of the prefrontal cortex and that leads to lack of a filter and creativity and anything goes. And that's good. And children are more creative. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until about 25. So in some ways, it's, not, it's okay to let go and it's healthy to do that. Um, but it's good to be able to turn it back on again when you need to, because there is problems if it's turned off all the time. Basically, it's interesting. I have friends who don't. I mean, I, th- I think I'm the only one in my, of my friends who does what I do, and I try to explain to them the challenge of having to be both a producer and sort of the talent or art or creating the art. You know, thinking about like this sort of thing, right? And switching between those two is very hard at least for me it's mm-hmm. very hard and they require very different skills mm-hmm. so yeah. I, I think yeah no I agree with you yeah the producer part would be like prefrontal cortex turned on you know yeah. order logic ra- problem you know, solve problem. boom 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 right. boom give it to me and then the creative is the letting go and you can be both you know I think I mean I, I feel like I do I have my science but I couldn't do my science as well and have that kind of very convergent thinking without being able to have the divergent thinking. You're very go. impressive. Our audience should know. Audience, you should go into YouTube and put in Heather Berlin's name and it look especially for a um, group that she was on, Star Talk. Oh, yeah. With uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, this girl, Nerdy. She uh, has Nerdy Talk Radio or something. Oh, um, Cara Santa Maria. Yeah, okay. And then a couple of comedians. comedians. That guy on the far left was so hilarious. That's great. And there's another one I did actually at BAM, which was with Mayim Bialik. It was with Neil, Bill Nye, Paul Rudd, and another, Paul yeah, and another comedian, um, Michael Ian Black, so cool. and Eugene Merman. It was, it was, that was so much fun. And we did it in front of a live audience at, at Brooklyn Academy. I didn't know stuff like that existed. I had never yeah. seen that show before. I had heard. If, and, yeah, it's a great one. And actually, just filmed one now. He's doing it, a TV show now for Nat Geo. Who um, Neil deGrasse? Neil De- he's so much Star better at, like that than uh, I don't like the cosmos, the canned stuff. cosmos thing. Yeah, I mean, he was so not, much cooler. When than he has I to read from a script like that, I think it doesn't. 
give no, him. You don't his get the passion comes out. He's yeah, real. He's the real deal. The full Neil. Yeah, he's great. Um, and he's visceral. He's a visceral guy. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, if you go, I have a website, heatherberlin.com. And if you go there, you can, there's like a video section. You Please can see do, all those videos. Audience. And, yeah. Last yeah. question. What? Yeah. Tell us what makes a genius. How do we know if we're geniuses? And how do we know, <laughs> more importantly, if we're not? <laughs> well, technically, I mean, the technical way that I would do it is... Um, <laughs> You know, there's these IQ tests that you can give, and if you're above no, a certain that, I, IQ, I failed those. Yeah, I failed okay. Those. So that's that. But um, I think <laughs> that my definition of genius is that people who you think outside the box, right? You you think about things that nobody else had thought of before. You put things together in a way. So, like for instance, Darwin, right? There was all this data out there of like out there, and other other biologists had that information, but he took that data and put it together in this novel way, creating this this ultimate theory of evolution, right? People who have the information that we all have access to, but think about it in novel ways. So I think this idea of divergent thinking, of putting pieces together in a way that nobody thought of, and then when they think of it, everyone's like, oh, of course, that's obvious, but nobody else did. So my definition of, of genius sort of revolves around the idea of creativity. Um, and I think that that's, and it can be in any field, discipline, music, art, science, you can be a creative genius, you know, but that's where I place it. And it's not necessarily about being able to do math problems the quickest or you know have the highest vocabulary but it's like what you use with the tools that you're given being able to synthesize and pull apart from different aspects and ideas and create something entirely new yeah and i could sort of some people call this like fluid intelligence and you know there, there's knowledge that you can accumulate you can be the best sort of like people say book smart person right i can memorize everything in the books and have that with me but, but what do you mean what, what do you do with that mm. what do you make of that and that's a deeper kind of understanding and i think that is what differentiates genius from others you hear that audience heather berlin is telling all of you that you should listen to hidden forces because we cover <laughs> different topics every week mm. and we're helping you to synthesize your genius brains and come up with genius ideas and that's why you listen to the show dr berlin you are an amazing guest Aww, it was you. such a pleasure to have you on thanks for thank having you so me. much for coming on the yeah. program thank you and that was my episode with heather berlin i want to thank dr berlin for being on my program today's episode was produced by me and edited by stilianos nicolau sound engineering is also by stilianos nicolau for more episodes you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com Join the conversation through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.